I don't think I've ever asked this question of a pastor, a man, a woman of, of faith, but what is the most challenging part of you being a pastor and a, a leader in the faith community? What is the most difficult and challenging part of your job? Yeah, it's not preaching. Preaching is only probably 25% of it. Mm -hmm. It's dealing with people, mm -hmm. dealing with our people, mm -hmm. dealing with their complexities, dealing with their struggles, their challenges, which are many, mm -hmm. which are sort of, you know, multitudinous It as could be well. financial, it could be health, it could be it social, It could be all of those economic. at one time. Mm -hmm. That's the issue. And uh, the breakdown of the black family is something that you're going to always deal with. It's going to always circle around that somehow uh, or circle around uh, issues of personal responsibility or uh, financial issues, etc. And so that's why the church has to be relevant to be relevant. It has to be able to address right. um, uh, things like that, which you'll find out there is scriptural basis for, uh, but we have to go even beyond that to reach our people on a practical basis that they might be able to have their lives enriched. And with the new generation of technology and connections, how do you connect with, you have a large uh, number of young people, whether mm -hmm. Z, X, millennial, whatever, uh, in your congregation. What, what, how are you connecting with them differently than maybe 20 years ago? You know, that's amazing, and it is a challenge. Uh, sometimes, you know, I've been there 47 years, mm. and so I would think that I would be totally irrelevant to that demographic at this point. Mm. Uh, however, uh, I find that what they connect to is authenticity. They connect to people being real. Uh, they connect to someone being honest. Mm -hmm. They connect to all of those kinds of things. And I think that uh, what I've, I think, been able to do is uh, put people around me as well. So it's not just my voice. Mm -hmm. My voice would be the senior voice. But to also put people around me uh, who um, I have mentored or trained or whatever uh, to also speak directly to some of those things. So there's diversity on my staff yeah. in terms of demographic. There's... Uh, we seek to be intentional right. about diversity in terms of participation in the life of the church. Is it still overwhelmingly, uh, as far as membership, dominated by women? Well, you know, that's an interesting thing. In most churches, it is. In my church, it's very close to 50-50. And what do you attribute that to? 55-45 or something like that. I think um, some of it is my long tenure. And the stability, I think some of it is, um, you know, uh, an enduring marriage with my wife. And that image, I believe, is very, very important to people nowadays. They're looking for um, something to look up to. As individualistic as people are, mm -hmm. um, as self-motivated as they are, mm -hmm. they're still looking <laughs> for a standard. They're looking for someone, somebody something to look up to. Yeah. And I think that, you know, gracefully, we've been able to maintain that. And speaking of the First Lady, she's very instrumental of your, in your success as a partnership. She's very involved, not only in the church, but in the community, mm -hmm. as well as you. Mm -hmm. um, do you, I know you do, you would not say otherwise, but you attribute some of your success to her, of course. Absolutely, she's a, she's a rock for me. Uh, in every sense of the way, and um, with my ministry as well, and has always been very deep. I've heard her preach. Oh yeah. Oh my goodness, you oh, in yeah. trouble, man. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what what's so great is it's a compliment. It's yes. not a competition. It's a compliment, yes. right. and always has been. Right. And um, you know, she has no desire to try to you know do anything otherwise. So right. it's great, and uh, and again. Um, she is seeing, and then other women are so drawn by that level of participation, that level of partnership 
that right. they see with us. I've seen her, and she's worked on, with us on several projects with mm -hmm. the state, going out in the community with either COVID or census or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. But I, I've, I've seen the connection that you're referring to with the other uh, first ladies and yes. uh, leaders in the community. Uh, I know she's hosted several women forums. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, a variety of topics that are very powerful. Right. Uh, you'd be surprised who watches your your uh, your telecast. Uh, How about you know, that? A lot of folks do, and we talk about it, too. Uh, but you also have a very strong economic development background and mm -hmm. a service to the community. Yes. Vanguard. Yes. What is it? Well, uh, 30 years ago or so, uh, when we moved off the Lower East Side, uh, we were on Cadillac Boulevard there in Gothi over in the Low East Side area, and uh, we moved over to East Grand Boulevard, 975 there. Uh, there were several things that were missing in that community. Um, it was a community basically of retirees at the time. Uh, General Motors was still down the street. Uh, there on the boulevard, uh, they had uh, so-called adopted uh, the street, and there Is that was a Pole lot Town of Town area. Would you say, or a we weren't further? quite Pole Town. Okay. Pole Town's on the other side of I seventy five, but what was happening there is, is that this was to be this great area of development that General Motors was going to help to develop, and there was going to be all kinds of things going on. Of course. That did not quite happen. General Motors moved uh, downtown to the Renaissance Center. And so there was a void mm -hmm. there. Uh, Vanguard has a very, very interesting history in terms of starting. Of course, I wanted to start mm -hmm. this community development corporation right there. I wanted to build housing. I wanted to have uh, impactful programs uh, for young people, for seniors, etc. All the other stuff that right. I do. Right. Um, but what we saw was there were two schools down the street at the time. Flix was there. Yeah. That was their original place that they were there, the foreign language school. Uh, and there was another school that was there that was K through 8. Mm -hmm. And um, so there was a lot of uh, kids in the neighborhood, a lot of bustling uh, educational activity going on. But... As you remember, mm -hmm. during that time uh, when Governor Engler was governor, there was a Work First program right. that required single mothers uh, to either work That's right. or to be in a training program in order to receive their benefits. And so it took them out of the home mm -hmm. at the time, and these mothers were not able to go back and get their kids after school. Uh, this was well before so-called after-school programs became sexy. Yes. Uh, it was well before that. We really met a need, and what we did, uh, I went down to the schools and met with the parents uh, of these kids because here's what was happening. This is very interesting. Here's what was happening. At 3.30, by law, the kids had to leave the building. That's right. If kids were abandoned, which they were, because they were, their mothers were in the Work First program. All social services. Then, then the police had to be called. Mm -hmm. The precinct had to come over and get these abandoned kids by law, take them to the precinct where the parents had to be called by law, and they had to come get their kids. Mm. Well, they couldn't come get their kids because they were in the Work First That's program right. until the Work First program was over for the day. So every day... I would go down there and I would see, uh, uh, you know, paddy wagons and uh, old police vehicles and old uh, 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 prisoner buses, literally, with the um, slots on the side, right. picking up the kids, taking them to the precinct. And, of course, that process would start every day. I thought it was demeaning. Yeah. I thought that it was unconscionable. And so that's that. And was it's the, the programming too. It's programming kids for, for well, possibly yeah, yeah absolutely for failure, and uh, because they're disconnected. Mm -hmm. And so what we did was, um, I went down and 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 I established in our church, which was one block down the street. Um, I had volunteers coming in to fix breakfast at six o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. 
and they would fix breakfast. We had a banquet hall there. They would fix breakfast for these kids, and the the parents could drop their kids off at the church. Right. We bought buses, a fleet of buses, to be able to take them one block down the street to school, of right. course with their permission. Right. And with of course with the consent of the, the educational leadership as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Well, we took them to school, we came back at 315, picked, picked them, them up, up, brought them back, fed them again, <laughs> fed them again, and had computers there, a computer lab, and that was the beginning of Vanguard. Wow. It was meeting a critical need in the community at that time with young people, uh, helping parents to navigate through this program that they had to right. submit to in order to get their benefits. And so that's how so the this, Vanguard that, started. That's the, and, and from that, you have developed this into or built this into a $63 million venture with housing, development. I mean, I've, I haven't seen anything like this. And it's an untold story. Yeah, I, um, I, I've, uh, you know, when you put your nose to the ground, a lot of times you're supposed to be waving your flag, <laughs> but you don't right. end up waving your flag. Right. You just do what you do. I mean, you're that kind of person. Yeah, where you just that. do what you do. Yeah. And a lot of times people don't always know all of your accomplishments. This is one of the greatest things I think that I've been able to accomplish. And I say that very humbly because the transformation of people ought to result in the outcome of the transformation of a community. Yes. And so if I'm there seeking to transform lives, I want to make sure that transformed lives can live in a transformed community. So we've, we've, these, all these accomplishments inside the faith-based community, outside the community for our public, what's next? What, what's, what's on the, the crust of success for the next steps? Well, I've, I've um, organized a nonprofit called Detroit Equity Inc. Uh, Detroit Equity Inc. is an opportunity with much of my um, business work in the business community uh, and um, uh, with the corporate community as well. I've been doing corporate consulting for mm -hmm. a number of years, 20 years or so, mm -hmm. uh, executive coaching, etc. And so I'm in a position, uh, I believe, to be somewhat of a translator you know, somewhat of a liaison. I, uh, I sit in the boardroom and I'm in the hood. Right. And I'm able to right. find ways to bring the two together and to create language that helps them to understand right. one another. Um, equities, uh, um, or has been, I should say, a big uh, deal here recently Though, Community benefits and other thing else, but yes. you have had a solid impact on the success of these companies and their connection to the community. Yes. I mean, yes. I've, I've seen it firsthand with District Detroit. Yes. I'm seeing it with Henry Ford. Yes. I'm seeing it with the police commission. Yes. So uh, you may not have to wave that flag, but people mm -hmm. do know what you're doing. And I think that this next step, this next venture of yours is going to be very powerful, uh, not only to the community, our community, but the corporate community, because there is that gap. They well, don't. Here's what I found. They don't have the connection. Here's what I found, Mario. Um, Twenty percent of the corporations get it. They know what they got to do. You know, they know what's right, and they want to do what's right. Twenty percent of them want to get it. <laughs> you know, and the but rest don't know of how them. To, but, but, but they, they don't know how. Yeah, right. Right. They don't right. know how. They right. don't know and how much. You, they want to balance. It what they feel to be, you know, different points of view mm -hmm. uh, within their constituency, et cetera, et cetera. They need a strong and yet uh, principled and reasonable way to achieve it. Mm -hmm. That's where I come in. Mm -hmm. And then there are, of course, are corporations who may or may not care very much about it at all. I'm really not talking so much about diversity, equity, and inclusion as I am about corporate responsibility. Right. I think that as we move forward, um, we know that there was the George Floyd epiphany. Uh, and, and after such uh, episodic epiphanies, normally people check boxes right. and move on. Right. Um, what I'm looking at is the continued corporate responsibility in corporate Detroit. And I'm grateful 
uh, I say that humbly again for the relationships that I've built down through the years and the trust uh, that I've built down through the years, which I think puts me in a good position to be helpful. Well, certainly what you have done in the past and what you're going to do in the future helps us all. And I appreciate it. And I'm sure those listeners and watchers who are watching the show, viewers, I should say, are actually very grateful to you for all that you have done and all that you are going to do. We're going to continue to watch you, pray for you, and assist you any way we can. Well, Mario, you've been a, a tremendous friend, uh, colleague. We've uh, come through battles together. That's right. We got the scars to show for it. Not always on the same side. <laughs> Not always on the same side either. Yeah. And that's the marvelous thing yeah. in this community that I think everybody has to learn is that, you know, we can have different points of view. We don't have to fall out. No. Uh, just because somebody had this candidate and somebody had that <laughs> right, candidate, right. then, you know, we fall out for years and years and years and the other person's no good forever. <laughs> That's ridiculous. It is. It's ridiculous. It is. Uh, and I think we're entitled to different points of view, different sides of the spectrum, and yet seeking to accomplish the same goal. The same goal. Well, Bishop, we want to certainly thank you for joining us on this episode of Casual Conversations. Thank you, you're, sir. I you're appreciate You're welcome you. to come back anytime. Well, thank you so very much. This has been a great experience. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Casual Conversations with Mario Morrow. We'll see you next time. <laughs>